And action, Matt. The idea for Aramina came when I was in a second-hand bookshop in Auckland, and something drew me to an old book, a tattered old copy of a book by Bill O'Brien called Aramoana, 22 Hours of Terror. And I glanced through it, um, expecting to put it down a couple of moments later, but something drew me to keep turning in. And from that night on, I was, I was enthralled in the story. When I took the project to, um, to my friend and fellow producer, Tim White, who, and we had the same sort of sensibility in what we like and what we want to see in a film, we had very much quality driven as our absolute aim. The choice of director was therefore the most pivotal decision we had to make early on and Robert Sarkis was our first and literally our only choice. I sort of said to the producers, well what I'd like to do is go down to Aramoana and, um, and talk to the people. And I worked with Graham Tetley, the, um, the, the writer of the film, we sort of co-wrote it. And the two of us sort of went down and um, rented a crib down there, a crib's a, like a beach house. The thing we didn't know when we rented a crib was that the crib that we'd rented, or that had been rented for us, was actually the crib of Helen Dixon. I'll change your sheets and put them through. Rob took me out uh, on the first night that we were there, and it's pitch black. Aramoina is pitch black. You can't see your hand at night. And uh, in the torchlight was the memorial to the, to the people that had died at Aramoina. And suddenly he realised where you were, this long list of 13 people, four of them children. And it's moments like that that the story started happening. It's, it's really tricky material to be dealing with because, you know, obviously um, the story centres around, a, you know, a, a guy with a gun who goes around killing people. Um, that element or the visceral part of that was not what I was interested in. You know, um, yes, as a filmmaker I did need to um, to depict something of the horror of of those murders, um, but I knew I wasn't making a horror film. Yeah. 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 Greg and I wanted to infuse the world of Aramoana with life. So any time you see kids running about or families, and there's a lot of that in the film, um, the camera is always, you know, handheld and energetic. It's, you know, it's almost like a handy cam, I suppose. Um, it's it, the camera is is living along with the characters. Whenever you see David Gray, by contrast, um, the camera is is usually static. Um, it's completely still. The only time we ever put the camera on a tripod was when we were shooting David Gray. I guess to depict the the lack of life in his life and, and there's a sadness there. With sound um, we tried to take the surreal element a step further. Sounds a, sound is a wonderful device and I think it's really underused. I think the creative use of sound is, is really underdone in film often. Um, I mean, so many films I go to see they're just plastered with music and it frustrates the hell out of me because I think audiences today are a lot more sophisticated than that. What I wanted to do with this film with uh, Dave Whitehead, our sound designer, was use sound creatively to help make this event feel experiential for the audience. Well, whatever you did there, I like. Yeah. I thought it was quite important right from the start that we did go to Aramoana and try and um, get a sense of the place itself. And we were recording, you know, uh, early hours of the morning, three o'clock in the morning, four in the morning, and through recording dawn choruses. Uh, up in the hills uh, and the beaches and the different waves, we, we just kind of captured the, the ambience of the place, um, which was really the, the bed that we created everything on because I think it was important that we were able to strip away just extraneous noise and just fall back on the beauty of Aramoana. Yep. And action! Casting is a hugely impor important part of the process to me and you know, with Rachel Bullock, our casting director, we, we went out to really find people who could capture something of the truth of each of these real people. So we were really looking for um, a, a, just a combination of actors and non-actors who, um, who just Jasmine, made me go, yeah, that's, that's Gary Holden, or yeah, that's Chiquita Holden, you know, and, and who captured something, you know, something that was real about those, about those people. Chiquita and Gary and me. 
so that by eating well we will live well and be happy together. Okay, okay, okay. We went to Aramoana Beach just for like a family bonding picnic it was called and we just got to know each other, talked a bit and Simon and Tandy, they made it really fun, you know, having games and everything and um, just wanted to talk about characters and yeah, so we just did a bit of things like that. And that was that was priceless. That was um, a chance just to to really get to know each other and, and to not um, to not be feeling that we you know when we step on set that we we were all, all of a sudden we had to to be acting because it was I think it was really important for for the film and and um, for all of us to actually just feel like we were just behaving and just being there and just being a family because we had done quite a lot of. Uh rehearsal and bonding sort of exercises as a family. Um, I just think there's some nice detail. You know when you feel free to touch someone and put their hair behind their ear or you know be stupid to them or play jokes on them or, or whatever. So hopefully little moments like that will inform those scenes. What we ended up with in the casting of the film was this fantastic combination of um, the experience of someone like um, Carlo Barn or Matt Sunderland, who plays David Gray, and complete inexperience. You know, uh, Lois Lorne, who who plays Helen Dixon, is one of the stars of the film. Um, you know, she's 74. She hasn't acted since the 1950s, <laughs> and even then, it was like an amateur dramatics. Well, I guess when I first went across for the audition, I was thinking of being an extra, a little old lady they were wanting for some reason or other. I couldn't didn't imagine I'd ever be in the part I eventually got. <laughs> the bruises, I could get bruising. We were rehearsing in Wellington. I was working with Bruce Phillips and he had to actually push me to get me away. I was being, we were both being shot at. I suppose we were doing it about the third or fourth time and, and um, uh, Robert said, you know, be a bit more uh, urgent with the, with the fact and of course he, he pushed a bit soon, and I didn't land on the on the on the, the, the mattress. I landed on the wooden floor, which was. <laughs> However, no, I, I didn't didn't stop me liking brutes. <laughs> yeah. That's a fire. By golly, it is too. Um, I play the role of Nick Harvey, who is a uh, sort of friendly small town cop uh, trying to function in the, in the face of extreme catastrophe. Um, uh, for him, being on the scene was his job, um, but the conflict, his job conflict, was the fact that the people the victims who were lying around were actually very dear personal family friends. Vic! Vanessa. Is that you, Vanessa? Vic, Vic, help me. Help me. We had a, uh, a couple of days of training with the anti-terror squad boys down in Wellington, and um, we went out to a... Uh, uh, kind of a, a vacant lot where they sell old houses and they've just got all these old houses there so it was like a perfect mock-up of a, uh, a, a suburb. We met them so we could go through weapons training, um, how they behave uh, in, in certain situations to give us an instinct and an emotional kind of connection to what we had to go and do. One of the, the uh, ATS guys is going to be in a house way down on that street. So in that area you're not going to know exactly where it is, it's way down there. Uh, and so we had to go and find the guy and we had to try and not get killed and you don't know at any time somebody's going to appear out of a doorway and go bang and that's what it was like. Matt walked into the room when he did his audition and he just was David Gray. This is a role that he was born to play. I think he's brilliant. He was able to capture, I guess, a combination of both the darkness of the David Gray character and also the fragility of, of his mind. It's certainly not my job to judge him in any way. Uh, and I certainly came out of the whole process with a lot of uh, empathy for him. 
you know, discovering little things like, you know, he was a he was an artist in his own right, you know.